Ladies and gentlemen, Violent Games here. Today, I wanted to do another episode of the Violent Games Show. Where I talk about the game industry topics, um, news topics from time to time. And I also like to talk about what I've been up to this week. And I also want to add in what I'm looking forward to this week as well. Because I'm going to be mostly talking about last week and what I've been doing with gaming. So without further ado, let's jump in. So first off, I wanted to talk about Mario Odyssey. My friend got a Switch recently, and he bought like all of the major title for the Switch game. So I kind of wanted to revisit slash beat some of them, because I didn't beat all of them. And I managed to beat Mario Odyssey. And guys, this is the best Mario game I've ever played. I really enjoy it for what it is. The level design is top-notch. The platforming is top-notch. It's dynamic. You can use the Cappy ability to possess different creatures in your environment and use their abilities to interact with each level in a different way. And this constant variety is what keeps the game rich throughout the entire experience. You're constantly going into these new levels that are dramatically different from each other. They have different themes with different outfits for Mario. You can customize Mario in any way you like. And that is just really, really enjoyable. It's a very enjoyable game. The only thing that's really bad about Odyssey, in my opinion, is the lack of difficulty. Basically, there is no consequence to death, which really takes away the impact of dying. You don't feel like you're ever pressured to live in a situation. It's like, well, if I die, so be it. I'll just respond with 10 less coins. Big fucking deal. And I feel like that was kind of a missed opportunity to add some tension into the platforming, but basically the game has no tension in it. However, I just find the game so delightful that it never really bothered me. I really enjoyed the experience of playing Mario Odyssey. Do keep in mind though that the co-op is trash and you should play it by yourself. My Odyssey is not a two player game. The two player mechanic is very dull and the second player is gonna be hopelessly bored and the first player is gonna feel really weird because they aren't controlling Cappy and it's just, it's not fun. <laughs> the co-op in Mario Odyssey is just not fun, but the base game is more than enough for, uh, to warrant your purchase. It has an abundance of content. It has decent replay if you like exploring those levels. And if you're if you're looking for a game that is just fun and chill and just a de-stressor, Mario Odyssey is there for you. Another game I got to play in the Nintendo Switch exclusive line is Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now this is a game that I should by all in rights love 100%, but here's the thing, I'm about 70% in love with the game because while there are some things that I love about Breath of the Wild, being the you know open world, the movement, the hand glider especially, the way you can climb up any mountain, I think that's really cool. However, I feel like the game is marred by a lot of open world problems, meaning the world is kind of too big, there's a lot of emptiness within that space, exploration usually leads to either generic enemies to fight and kill which if you get really good at becomes monotonous you know busy work sometimes and i don't know i've kind of hit a wall with the game where i feel like i'm just doing repetitive things instead of focusing on what the good content is but i'm not really clear in my head as to where the good content is and i if i want to take a break from the busy work i often can't because i can't find any other content so i'm kind of struggling with that game in terms of getting myself engaged with it because of the open world nonsense because you have to keep getting food to heal you have to make sure that you're getting enough rupees and you have to do these optional puzzles to upgrade your character because on the master's difficulty you'll need to and not only that guys but in order to play on the hardest difficulty in breath of the wild you actually have to buy the season pass which pisses me off it is the most price gouging, money grubbing fucking scheme that Nintendo has ever put into a Zelda game, and I fucking hate that. Because the DLC is not worth it. I looked at the DLC, I wasn't interested, but I needed to play Master Mode because the game got too easy for me. And Master Mode does add more enemies and make more interesting encounters, so in my opinion that's the best DLC you get in the game because of the way I like to play these games. But it's not Dark Souls. It's. It, and the, the traversal of the world just, it gets repetitive. Like, I want to get to the, the moment to moment action. And then when I made it to one of the dungeons in the game, I went to the Zoran dungeon, basically, where the Zora people live. By the way, beautiful city um, color scheme and everything. I really enjoyed the aesthetic of that city. 
and just walking around and interacting with the Zoran people. But when I got to that dungeon, it was the most boring shit I've ever done in the game. It was just a bunch of repetitive puzzles. Well, actually, the puzzles were dynamic. I'm not going to lie to you. I shouldn't say that. I'm, I just have repetition on the brain. But it was just a little puzzle. And then I did a boss fight that wasn't really that challenging. And that is not what I want from a Zelda game. I miss those dungeons that I would play in the old Zelda games that were very intricately designed for the player to explore. And they had different segments. Some of them were puzzles. Some of them were combat. And I like that nuance better. I don't like just doing a puzzle in a room-sized area as opposed to doing this big, deep, interesting dungeon. But with all that said, I need to spend more time with this game before I, like, put a verdict on whether or not it's a good game or not. I just feel like it's marred by some bullshit. Also, the weapon degradation system is retarded. I wish it, was, it wasn't even in the game. It doesn't serve a purpose, really, other than to irritate the player. And the weapons are extremely fragile. Like, it's one thing to have a weapon degradation system. It's another thing for that to be absurd. Like, the, the steel weaponry in Breath of the Wild is extremely flimsy, which in real life, a sword would have a lot more mileage out of it than that. But who knows? Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Whatever. But, you, you know, Zelda Breath of the Wild... I feel like it's got a, it's a little overhyped for me. I feel like there are some problems with the game, but there are also moments of greatness, and both things need to be touched up upon. Next game I played also from my friend's Switch backlog, Yoshi's Crafted World. We did a, a session of co-op yesterday, actually, and I had a lot of fun with it, even though the game really wasn't designed for co-op. Now, what do I mean by that is that the level design is very linear, and it doesn't really accommodate the space for two people being on screen. It's like these levels weren't designed for two-player. However, they did add some mechanics into the two-player to make co-op a bit more compatible. So, for example, if you find that the screen space is too hard to manage during the more difficult platforming sec sections, you can actually hop onto one of the player's backs and kind of ride around Yoshi to Yoshi, if that's, if that's what turns you on. And what it allows you to do is one player can focus on throwing projectiles while the other player can focus on platforming. And during certain segments of the game where the platforming is really, really tight, and if you separate on screen, you could potentially die, it is convenient to just hop on your partner's back and have him focus the platforming and you focus the projectile use, and you play that way. So I like that they have mechanics surrounding it. They have some weird mechanics as well. Like, for example, you can swallow your partner and spit him out at people like he is a projectile and you can use actually other yoshis to kill enemies if you don't have eggs available which is weird but it comes in handy from time to time but more often than not i find you accidentally do this and it just leads to hilarity which adds a little bit of charm to the game and another thing that's kind of weird about yoshi's crafted world is i've noticed the level design is very little big planet-esque it feels like they ripped the environments straight out of little big planet and I wonder why more people aren't commenting on this. For some reason, Nintendo is doing this toys to life thing in their games now, because even in the new Zelda um, Link's Awakening remake, you see this toys to life aesthetic that I don't know why they're doing it. It doesn't really feel appropriate. I would rather see more games like Odyssey than this toys to life theme that I, I keep seeing Nintendo go for. But that's just my opinion. It's not going to detract from those games, and it didn't detract from Yoshi's Crafted World. All in all, Yoshi's Crafted World is a solid platformer that isn't overly difficult. It's just a fun, chill game. It's well-designed. The levels are interesting-looking. All the environments do pop, even though they're little big planet environments, and they're just fun to go through. It's just a simple, fun Yoshi game. And the mechanics are solid. The controls are tight, so... All in all, Yoshi's Crafted World looking pretty good so far. I might play some more of it at some point. Now, guys, I need to get on to some of the games I've been already playing from previous weeks, as well as just straight up beat them. So let's talk about what remains of Edith Finch real quickly. I beat the game finally. Oh, my gosh. It was hard for me to do this, guys. I had to play this game in uh, multiple sessions, spanning the course of several days, because the game... 
it, it hits home, guys. It hits home. This game will grip you in a way that other games just simply can't because of the way the narrative is portrayed and how it's a focus. The writing is just so outstanding that even though the game is on rails and you're literally just going through the motions, you as a player driving the action forward just makes it that much more immersive. And it really does show off that video games aren't just about mashing buttons or memorizing combos or platforming. Video games can also tell you a story and it can tell you a story in a way that other media can't. Like if you're watching a movie, you're, you're passively watching it. But with Edith Finch, when you pick up the controller and just pressing forward and getting through that scene, you being a part of that action puts you in that space so much more. Being in that first person perspective, going through the different um, memories of the Finch family or basically interpreting those stories the way that they are in those dream sequences as what I'll call them. It's amazing. And it gripped me in a way that no other narrative has in quite a long time. I teared up several times while playing this game and I had to put it down because it just made me think about a bunch of existential things. And not a lot of games can do that. How many games have you played that had an emo that uh, evoked an emotional response like that out of you? Where you're like you're questioning like or the game's basically telling you about life and death and how to deal with that and how people live their lives and it hits so close to home at times. The way they tell these stories is also very dynamic and interesting and I don't want to spoil that because I do feel like it is a spoiler to see some of these sequences played out. You really should play the game for yourself if you get the option. Buy this game or if you're a PlayStation Plus owner, download it immediately. You need to play this. I feel like it really changed the way I thought about Walking Sims. When I heard about Walking Sims, I immediately wrote them off as not really being video games. Slap myself in the face. Edith Finch is so worth it. The narrative itself is, it makes the ride so worth it. And the whole experience is on rails, which is usually something I hate, but it m adds so much impact to the environment. The environments are so well done and believable. You really do feel like you're going through these rooms of people who used to exist and you know so much about them, or at least you can formulate your own opinions about them just by looking at the stuff they have. And gosh, I loved it. I loved it. I feel like you'll walk away from this game a better person if you, if you play it start to finish. It will give you a new perspective on life. That was really deep, but I had to say it. Edith Finch, amazing game. Or what remains of Edith Finch. Let's do the whole title. Now, another game I beat that I actually covered, I think it was a couple weeks ago or maybe a week ago, was Pinstripe. Pinstripe is just a little puzzle platformer. It's an indie game, and it has all of the charm of those things. It has great voice acting, a really solid story, some overlining themes in the game that, you, that are elaborated on by the end. And what I will say is this, guys. This game is delightful, and you should play it, but only on the cheap side. Do not pay 15 for this game, only pay for it when it's on sale because the game is very, very short and to be quite honest with you, there are other games that do this but better. Like objectively, J.J. McAfield in the Island of Memories is far superior to Pinstripe both in amount of content, um, the puzzle platforming itself, the inner, the ongoing mechanics, the theme of the game and how it hits, it hits home and it hits an emotional note. I feel like Pinstripe is just outplayed by J.J. McAfield, but Pinstripe is not bad. It's a very fun, entertaining game. It's not hardcore. If you die, it's not the end of the world. You know, Pinstripe, it's, it's not punishing at all. It's just a fun little experience and it's good. It's just not amazing. It's not a standout game, and you could probably deal with skipping it. But if you have $8 to throw at an indie game that's on sale on your Switch or on your PS4, and you know you just need something to de-stress, Pinstripe's a good game for you. Especially if you're in between other releases, maybe you're waiting for something. This is a good this is a good pickup, especially on the cheap side. So now I want to talk a little bit about Rainbow Six. Now it, it's going to be brought up basically on a weekly basis because I can't stop fucking playing the game. But I'm just going to focus on the news surrounding Rainbow Six. And that is Operation Phantom Sight has been officially announced. We know everything there is to know about each character. And I kind of want to just give my opinions on some of these operators. So 
First off, we have Nook on attack. She basically has this really cool theme that is kind of grudge-esque. You know, like she has that Samara kind of vibe where like the netting on her helmet kind of looks like hair. And she has this weird creepy stance that she likes to take. I love the character aesthetically. It is a total fantasy character, but I enjoy that in RB6 from time to time. She has a very limited primary weapon selection being an SMG and a suppressed shotgun, as well as a 5.7 handgun and a little deagle that can also be suppressed. So a lot of um, stealth based things going about here for Phantom Sight. And her overall gadget and ability and utility, I actually am very interested in. So she's basically a splice between Kavera and Vigil, meaning that when she activates her ability, she is immune to cameras, she gets that distortion effect on Mozzie's drone and Echo's drones, but outside of that, she's completely impervious to cameras. She'll also create a ripple effect if she's sprinting while this ability is on, so there are some limitations to the ability to balance it. But having an uh, operator turn off another player's ears and being able to get the jump on them that way based on information is going to be huge. And I feel like that's why they limited her primary arsenal as a means of balancing her. So I'm very interested to see how that plays out in the long term. I feel like for um, advanced players like Pro League or like Diamond players, they're going to kill her very easily. But in public matches, she's probably going to be a nightmare, especially if people aren't communicating via the chat in game. It's going to be a huge problem for people. So I feel like Nook has a lot of interesting things going for her. I wonder if her um, primary loadout is going to be a problem. And she also brings two different utilities to the field being breach charges and claymores. And for her playstyle, I love these gadgets. I'm probably going to use them interchangeably because I find myself using one or the other depending on what map is on it. Am I going to be able to play this character or is everyone going to pick her for like weeks on end is going to be my real question. So whether or not I'll pick up the season pass might come down to that. I might actually just wait the extra week and buy it with the in-game renown because I probably have enough. But yeah, I really like the way Nook looks. Now, the other character that seems very situational to me is Warden, the defender. I love his aesthetic because he looks just like Commissioner Gordon. And I fucking adore it. I don't know why. I just think it looks so funny. He has like this cool running animation. He's a three armor um, one speed though, which is kind of what I don't like. By the way, Nook is two armor, two speed. I forgot to bring that up. But you know what? This isn't a Rainbow Six channel. But he's basically a very slow character and he's an anchor, meaning that he should stay closer to objective. His ability is that he can turn on these special glasses that allow you to see through smoke, recover from flashbangs, completely negate the effects of flashbangs so characters like ying will be directly countered to him but the other thing that he's kind of marred by is this very bad weapon selection he has the mpx that valkyrie has which isn't a very good gun unless you land those headshots it also doesn't have an acog which would be very appropriate for this operator and i don't know why he doesn't have one i feel like putting an acog on his gun would separate him from valkyrie in a way Maybe even giving him a custom sight for it, since that seems to be a gimmick that RB6 likes to focus on right now. Um, his ability, though, if your enemies aren't using smokes or flashbangs, is completely worthless. So I do say that he is definitely a situational anchor, but he's also got a high skill gap because of his limited arsenal. It's going to take a good player to make the best use of this character and when and when not to implement his gadget. So I feel like Warden is kind of stuck in that. Um box but what i will say about the operation as a whole guys is this operation reused assets because in all honesty if you think about both of these characters nothing is new about them in terms of the game engine they're using weapons that already exist in the game um nook's design is completely ripped from habana if you look at the way habana's jumpsuit looks nook's is almost a direct copy minus a few gloves and that special helmet from that um, special opera. I wish I could show it to you guys. It looks awesome. But a lot of the assets seem to be reused in this one. They didn't really make unique weaponry for these characters. And it does kind of feel like they reused a few assets in terms of the character's stance and design. Like, like I said, 
the uncanny resemblance of the body of Nook and Habana are just uh, outrageous. It's like they literally just took Habana's model, tweaked it slightly, and called her Nook. That's what it feels like. I got a burp. Oh, oh. Okay, we made it. I talked about all the games I played this week. God, that was a fucking... That was 20 minutes long. Jesus Christ. Ugh. Let's talk about games that I'm looking forward to this week. Games that I'm probably going to add to the next Violent Game show and talk about. So I want to play A Plague Tale Innocence. This is the new game that I've been looking at for the most time. And everyone's saying it's a good game. It looks gorgeous. They're comparing it to Send You a Sacrifice, God of War, and Thief. I, I, I Look, guys, I'm in. I'm in. That's all they needed to say. And I've seen some of the voice work at play, and I've seen some of the level designs and the themes and the rats, and I love everything. I love everything about the way this game looks. So I'm going to be playing that one, and hopefully you'll have an opinion from me um, within a week or two. We'll see how my money goes. Money, money is the real challenge here. Next up, I want to try to play Soma. I played some Soma, but I didn't really play enough to give you an impression, but the game doesn't seem too scary to me compared to Amnesia. This is a game by Frictional Games, of course, who made Amnesia, that's why I'm making that direct comparison, but it was a game that also came out for free on PSN. It's in a horror genre, which is probably one of my favorite genres ever, so I need to take some time with this one, maybe spend an hour to 30 minutes on it, try to get my impressions, see if I care to play the game on. And then I want to go in my backlog and try to finish Doom 2016. I'm probably more than halfway through the game, but I had to drop it for other things like the Resident Evil 2 remake. The fact that I bought this game way later than its release date was probably a shame. I probably would have beaten it by now. But you know what? It gives me something to talk about on the show that I didn't cover so far. So Doom 2016, I want to get back into it. The game is just fun, fast-paced action, heavy metal theme, testosterone, it encourages you to keep moving and not hold angles like an RB6. Like, you need to run around and jump around and shit, and that's what Doom is about, and it's a very different type of shooter. In that 60 frames per second, 4K checkerboard graphics, it looks really good. I really enjoy Doom. And I can't wait to further emphasize on why when I get into that violent game show coming later. All right, guys, let's move on to the news topic. I want to talk about State of Play. This was May 9th. I am way behind, and it is entirely my fault. I, it completely passed, like, slipped my mind. And I feel like the reason for that is because these shows haven't been really exciting. So I'm just going to go over State of Play game to game because it was only, like, 12 minutes long. And I can just cover all of it with you right now so you don't have to bother yourselves with it. So first off, they showed off the Monster Hunter DLC Iceborne. Oh, Iceborne. I fucking don't know why people like Monster Hunter, to be perfectly honest with you. I kind of fell out of love with JRPGs a long time ago, and that's what this looks like at its core. But what I will say about Monster Hunter World, it sold a shit ton of copies. Like, way more than I thought, honestly. So it's good to hear that, you know, Sony, I guess, has the marketing rights to Monster Hunter World and it has a fan base that is probably going to, you know, get really hard over this DLC. The game definitely looks good, but it it's not something I'm interested in. I don't like games that have really retarded amounts of content that focus more on the multiplayer aspect and the actual mechanics. And yeah, I don't like I don't like games that eat up much of my time, basically. I like I like enjoying a bunch of different games and getting that variety in my life. It, it, it's more entertaining to me to enjoy games that way. But there you go, Monster Hunter World's DLC Iceborne is coming out. It doesn't look like shit. So next one I saw is called a game called River Bond, which is basically a new dungeon crawler. It features a lot of other characters from other IPs as like a sort of um i don't know gimmick i don't even know how i would define it but basically it's a bunch of pixel art looking stuff and this game has no appeal to me whatsoever it doesn't look appealing at all i don't like the art style the gameplay looks very repetitive and the inclusion of other characters like shovel knot and rasputin from psychonauts is not going to entice me to play the game especially when those characters are just they look like minecraft pixel blocks and I'm not into it. It's just something that I'm writing off. I'm not really, I don't care. Now the third game they showed off is a new 
um, fucking isometric multiplayer game called Predator Hunting Grounds. Now, we saw no gameplay for this game. We saw a very shitty looking trailer. I'm immediately not interested. But however, I, I like the idea of a Predator game not sucking, so I'm going to humor it. I'm going to follow up with this one as soon as we get more information. But until we get more information, I have to call it as it is, guys. The trailer looks like garbage, and I'm not hyped. It looks like there's going to be like four or five marine characters versus a, a Predator. And these isometric games, the problem they often have is balance. And I feel like until you can convince me that this game is balanced in a way that is fair, I just, I'm not really hyped for these games. Like, you know, you have games like... What, what, God, I can't remember any of these games titles. You know what? Fuck it. There, there's this one. It's kind of like the Jason game, the Friday the 13th game that is kind of like this. But people always find the metas in these things. And then it winds up being a dull experience as a result. Where either Jason is overpowered because he knows entirely what he's doing. Or the players are overpowered because they know how to gain all the resources in the environment really fast. So I'm not really into the isometric multiplayer genre. We'll see if it's implemented correctly for the sake of this genre actually, you know, getting my attention. But until it happens, I have to be a naysayer. I have to be. I have to do it. The game looks like shit to me. I'm sorry. And then we got to get uh, see some more of Medieval Remastered. It looks great to me, honestly. I love the the Spyro remaster. The Crash remaster apparently wasn't done completely up to snuff because the platforming wasn't implemented well in one of the games. But this game looks like a one-to-one -one remaster. So it, it's not like they really innovated the gameplay or camera angles or combat system. They just kept the old one. And I'm wondering, do you think that was a good idea? Because I can see the um, differences between the Spyro games, for example, and how they tighten things up. And I would rather see more of that than, like, more of the same. Now, granted, I never actually beat Medieval back in the day. I only played a demo on Jam Pack way back in the PlayStation 1 era. If you even know what Jam Pack is, you're a god, by the way. But yeah, we got it from, like, a pizza place or something. They, they had, like, a little disc called the Jam Pack demo. And I played Medieval, like on a demo basis from there so i'm interested in medieval obviously because i've never played and beaten the game but i want to hear from you guys if you think that this looks good to you for me i'm kind of have a mixed opinion because like some of the gameplay mechanics look outdated to me and i wonder if that will be a turnoff for me being a modern gamer and having played all these newer games and falling in love with them so Medieval Remastered comes out October 25th, a very appropriate release date. I don't think it's going up against much anything else, so that's a PS4 exclusive right there, ladies and gentlemen. It's a game that looks solid, and it's an uh, existing franchise with an existing fan base that have probably not seen a Medieval game in how long, so I'm happy for those people. Sony seems to be nailing those remasters, by the way. The Ratchet and Clank one also being an exceptional game that I might have to revisit here shortly. Now, the next game is probably my favorite game of the show. This is the game that I was like, what is this? This is the most interesting shit ever. It's called Away. You play as a flying squirrel, and the objective, I guess, is to survive different things that happen in the environment. And there's just this grand sense of scale. You really feel like you're a small, crepuscular-type creature just crawling through the grass, looking for things to eat, trying to avoid any type of predators. They showed off some large animals running by you. And I'm like, that perspective hasn't really been touched on in a game in that style of setting before. And also, I saw some gliding mechanics because you literally are a flying squirrel in this game. Maybe you play as other creatures. I don't know yet. And then I saw that during some of the levels, some natural disasters were happening as well. And I'm looking forward to this game. I don't even know what it is, but I'm like enthralled with what this game is. It just doesn't seem like anything I've played before. And it just sounds crazy. So yeah, playing as a flying squirrel, jumping through the trees. I wish I was able to rip footage, but none of my capture cards will let me do it without HTCP ruining my life. So yeah, that's Away. That is definitely the most interesting game I've ever seen. It looks like it's going to be a mix between combat, stealth, and platforming. And I'm into all of those things. So happy gamer. I'm at least interested in it. I hope it goes off well because these artistic games go one way or the other usually. 
And then finally, we got to saw some of the final Fantasy VII remakes. It looks good to me, but honestly, guys, I have no frame of reference. I have never played Final Fantasy VII, and some people would view that as an egregious crime. And Final Fantasy VII is probably one of the most highly regarded games in the industry ever. Like, if, if people talk about their favorite games, especially in terms of JRPGs, Final Fantasy VII is probably the most memed fucking game I've ever heard throughout my entire life, and I've never played it. So I'm very interested in this new remake, but however, I have to add the caveat that JRPGs are not in my wheelhouse anymore. I'm wondering if that is going to mar the experience. And I also want to hear from other players, how different is this game from the original Final Fantasy VII? I honestly don't know. I think the original Final Fantasy VII was more of a turn-based attack game kind of thing, or, turn, or turn-based RPG is what I should be saying. And then this one is more of like an action game, it almost looks like. And I'm more interested in it for that reason, but I don't know. I, I, if you're a Final Fantasy uh, VII uh, fan, let me know what you think about it. My, my brain is turning into mashed potatoes. I'm so fucking sorry. <laughs> Anyways, guys, that's really all I have for you today. I'm going to skip the topic because my brain is crap. I've been having stomach issues all freaking day. It's not been fun. So, yeah, I'm going to go deal with that. <laughs> and you guys have a good one. Continue to play good games. It's a violent game signing off. God.